Forget about the thing with Nintendo. The real Sega rivalry emerges here. I love soul food. People tend to think of Nintendo and Sega as bitter video game rivals. And maybe that was true in the 1990s, but back in the 80s, in the arcades, it was really Sega versus Namco. And that rivalry manifests here with Shinobi. Looking back at the history of arcade games in Japan, Namco stands at the pinnacle for the form. Taito may have kicked off coin-op mania with Space Invaders, but they never managed to land another hit on that same enormous scale. That's not to say they up and vanished. They're one of the few companies still operating their own arcades in Tokyo in 2024. But nothing Taito created after Space Invaders ever managed to fare anywhere near as well as it had. Instead, Namco took the torch and ran with it, delivering hit after hit in game centers everywhere throughout the 80s and well into the late 1990s. Pac-Man was one of the few games to actually eclipse Space Invaders' success in Japan, and anyone who has spent more than 10 minutes watching this channel needs no introduction to Xevious or the Tower of Druaga. Namco ruled Japan's arcades for years. And then there's Sega. We all know that Sega got its start in arcades as well. Of course, unlike Namco, Sega even decided to dip a toe into the waters of making consoles instead of simply licensing its games to console manufacturers. For a brief moment, Sega even published a Namco game for SG-1000, a rare instance of collaboration for the two rivals. But rivals they were. Sega managed to pull off some pretty respectable feats of engineering in arcades with games like Turbo and Zaxxon, which were quickly matched by Namco. And the reverse was true, too. Pac-Man gave us Pengo, and Sega openly looked to Mappy when creating Flicky. Turbo, in particular, appeared to lock the two companies into a game of one-upsmanship. Namco countered Turbo with pole position, kicking off racing tech competition that led to masterpieces like OutRun and eventually gave us both Virtua Racing and Ridge Racer. Everyone thinks of Nintendo and Sega as bitter rivals, but that was only really true on the home consumer side of things. And that mostly emerged in the 1990s, once Sega began taking direct shots at Nintendo. During the 80s though, Sega treated its home consoles more as a side project. A little stream of extra revenue to supplant their world-class arcade innovations. I'd argue that Sega didn't really figure out what it means to be a console company until Sonic the Hedgehog. As we've seen here on Master System, the majority of Sega's home releases either arrived directly from the coin-op space, largely unchanged, or else operated with a pay-to-play mentality. Pack were two years into the Master System's life and only have a single game with any sort of session-to-session -session persistence, namely Penguin Land, which primarily used its battery backup to support custom level designs. Compare that to the NES space, where more than a dozen games had offered battery or password saves by mid-88, and you can see that Sega largely approached console design with the same mindset as Atari and its 7800 an extension of the vending amusement business rather than a compliment. Sonic the Hedgehog was notable because it managed to capture the high-speed thrills and intensity of a Sega arcade game, yet contained enough depth and nuance to encourage repeated play. But that was 1991. Here in 1988, Sega really didn't get consoles the same way that they did coin-op production, and that meant that their true rival was Namco. With Shinobi, we see Sega briefly claiming the upper hand, in that back and forth rivalry. Shinobi is unquestionably a straight up ripoff of a Namco arcade hit called Rolling Thunder. Debuting in November 1986, Rolling Thunder had been Namco's entry into the run and gun platform format pioneered by the likes of Ghosts and Goblins and Contra. Namco offered their own distinct spin on the game type with Rolling Thunder and its 1960s spy mod vibes. Also, while it scrolled freely right and left, it also included a degree of vertical tracking as well. Unlike Contra, which had been regimented and dividing out vertical and horizontal scrolling segments, Rolling Thunder worked a little more like Ghosts and Goblins, in that the vertical axis could come into play with a level design unexpectedly at any time. Protagonist Albatross could walk, duck, jump, and shoot, but he had two modes for jumping. His standard jump allowed him to hop straight up into the air, or to vault forward to clear and climb low obstacles. His jumping controls worked a lot like Arthur's in Ghosts and Goblins, really, with no mid-air adjustments to his trajectory. 
but he moved more quickly than Arthur and didn't have to deal with nearly as many platforming segments or swift aerial enemies, making the leaps in Rolling Thunder feel far less punishing. And then there was his high jump ability, which allowed Albatross to make a flying leap straight up into the air. This made it possible to switch between parallel tracks in many of the stages, bounding upward to balconies or upper floors in order to take on overhead enemies, dodge hazards, or seek power-ups. Because Albatross could only fire straight ahead while either standing or kneeling, vaulting up and down between floors was the only way to deal with hazards on different tracks of the level. No diagonal fire here as in Contra. This setup gave Rolling Thunder a distinct rhythm of walk, pause, fire, leap, more precise than something like Contra, but speedier and more responsive than Ghosts and Goblins. It was a real eye-catcher in arcades, and it offered addictive bursts of play. Sega, their eye ever on their most nefarious rival, took notice, made notes, and delivered their inevitable counter-programming. One year later, in November 1987, Sega's response to Rolling Thunder arrived in the form of Shinobi. And while it pains me to say it, given how much I love Rolling Thunder, Shinobi brilliantly improved on Rolling Thunder's design. For starters, you play as a ninja. I think you're also a cop, but I'm not going to count that as a knock because your mission involves rescuing innocent kids from what appears to be an army of Arnold Schwarzeneggers with rocket launchers, while you're only armed with a sword and a tiny throwing blade. If more cops were willing to take on such ferocious odds for a truly noble cause like this, they'd have a much better reputation in the first place. So good on protagonist Joe Musashi for running such a good PR game. Joe has very similar skills to Albatross, with one crucial exception. He knows how to melee. Albatross relied entirely on his sidearm, which he could fire rapidly until he ran out of clips, at which point his rate of fire slowed drastically. I guess because he was loading bullets individually? Whatever the case, Joe can take out enemies at a distance with his shuriken. But it's not as important for him to maintain a safe range from bad guys as it was for Albatross. If foes get in close, Joe's attack button changes context automatically, and he strikes with his katana instead. This one difference aside, Joe and Albatross are, well, to be a little on the nose, birds of a feather. Joe has the same platform leaping jump skill as Albatross, up to and including the way you have to stand still and hold up when you press the jump button to pull it off. Like Albatross, he can also duck back down to a lower level by holding down as he jumps. Of course, this ability only works when the stage layout includes multi-level terrain and passable floors. The level design in Shinobi is more complex than that of Rolling Thunders, and it makes more active use of level switching as a basic navigational tool. This ties in with the rescue feature. Joe can't actually clear a level until he's liberated all the hostages in a stage, so there's more backtracking and maneuvering around obstructions as part of that process. If you reach a level exit door before rescuing all the kids, the exit door won't yield, forcing you to circle back in order to find the missing captives. You need to poke around every possible corner in order to find the hostages. Shinobi even makes use of a technique that would become popular in early Super NES games like Super Castlevania IV. You can only access some portions of some levels by moving into the background or foreground, which you accomplish by jumping between different tracks of ground at specific times. Overall, this makes for a platform shooter that requires a little more exploration and thought to navigate than usual for the format. Unsurprisingly then, Shinobi makes the transition to Master System in fine fettle. Just about every element of the arcade game comes through pretty accurately, including the god-awful bonus stages where you toss shuriken into the distance in order to take out enemy ninja before they leap out and slice your face. Let's all take a moment to be grateful that Sega didn't seize on this detail and decide to rebuild Shinobi for Master System around the 3D glasses. Thankfully, you don't have to perform perfectly in these stages, you simply earn bonuses if you do. You will definitely notice a few obvious changes in this conversion right up front. The Master System couldn't reproduce the large sprites seen in the arcade game, so everything has been scaled down slightly. This means that, along with Zillion 2, this is the most NES-looking game we've seen on the console to this point. There's something about the sprite designs and sizes along with some of the color palette choices and background texturing that feels more NES than Master System. That's not a bad thing precisely, but it does speak to the nature of this conversion. The NES became notorious for arcade ports that took tremendous technical and design liberties with the source material in order to balance out the unavoidable compromises forced by its aging tech. And Shinobi leans into that to a certain degree. 
Although it carries over the arcade game's level design and enemy placement pretty faithfully, it overhauls the way Joe takes damage in combat. In the arcade game, he dealt with injury similarly to Albatross. Weapons fire equaled single hit kills, but he could shrug off physical collisions with unarmed aggressors. Where Albatross could only withstand a single melee collision, Joe bounced back after a bump no matter how many times he took that tumble, the exception being attacks by enemy ninja, since they apparently had mastered the same contextual range-shifting attack arts as Joe. The Master System game splits the difference. Joe can't weather infinite collisions here, but he can stand up to a fair few. His endurance is determined by his newly acquired health meter at the top of the screen. Once that's done for, so is Joe. However, this cuts both ways, much in the way that a katana doesn't. Joe's acquisition of a health bar means that he can now survive what would have been single-hit kills in the arcade version, including projectiles and enemy attacks. The Master System game also changes up the rewards system. When you rescue a hostage, an indicator to the right of the health meter displays a different bonus. This can range from points to weapon upgrades to health boosts which means that it's more important than ever to rescue the little guys. The changes to the scale of the graphics and to Joe's health mechanics do have an effect on the overall feel of Shinobi for Master System. In some ways it makes Shinobi easier, because you can afford to play a little less carefully without running the risk of instant death. You do need to be mindful of the fact that Joe's health doesn't recharge between stages, meaning that sloppy play in one level puts you at a disadvantage once you start the next. You can't count on health boosts appearing when you need them, as they seem to be dispensed more or less at random. And you don't have multiple lives per credit as in the arcade. When Joe runs out of health, it's game over, and you only get a handful of continues. The game does have a stage select feature, but in the usual Master System way, that's a hidden element that requires a code input on the title screen rather than being an accessible quality of life option for all players. Curiously, the smaller sprite proportions also make for a more difficult game than the arcade version, at least in some senses. Because you can see more of the world at any given time, you need to be more mindful of enemies, as they have more visible real estate that they can occupy. This also makes precision targeting a little more difficult, something that comes to the fore when you face the first boss. That boss, Ken O, oh, barely notices your shuriken attacks unless you hit him directly in the face mask. Hitting that spot when his entire sprite is half of its original size, can be kind of tough. On the other hand, the new proportions can work in your favor at times. The second boss, a helicopter, is almost laughably toothless since you can pummel it with enough attacks to take it out before it even starts attacking you. So overall, I'd call this take on Shinobi a wash versus the arcade game. However, it unquestionably bests the NES version of the game, an unlicensed Tengen release developed by Sega's friends at Sanritsu, last seen converting Alien Syndrome. It also bests the NES version of Rolling Thunder, despite the fact that Namco designed that card around a custom chip for Famicom that Tengen managed to recreate reasonably well. So here in the first round of the Shinobi Wars, it's Sega 1, Namco 0. Joe Musashi would thrive on consoles, appearing in a succession of 16-bit releases for Genesis of impressive quality. As for Albatross, well, he had some sequels too, but they lost something vital when they shifted away from the original's bizarre Man from Uncle vs. Neon Clan Weirdos setup. Of course, the real Shinobi coup de grace would come 15 years later, not with the PlayStation 2 Shinobi, which was definitely cool, but fundamentally a different game experience. No, I'm talking about Hudson's Ninja 5 a professional fan game that became a cult favorite. It was Shinobi and then some. Here in 1988, though, Shinobi for Master System is a real high point for the console. Proof that all you needed for a great arcade conversion was great source material tweaked just enough to engage with the needs of console gaming. Sega knew it, too, giving Shinobi the cover story in the third issue of the Sega Challenge newsletter. I do question the company's choice to plaster the game's title screen across the cover. I mean, yeah, the full screen portrait of Joe Musashi was an impressive technical feat, but the loss of color depth in moving from System 16 to Master System flattened down to the arcade title screen's subtle shading and made Joe look awkwardly cross-eyed. Speaking as a former amblyopic, I do have to give him props. His eyesight makes his accuracy with Shuriken all the more impressive. As for the cover feature itself, well, we're talking about Sega Challenge. It's a two-page spread listed as a review. 
even though it doesn't actually offer opinions, criticism, or a score. It's just a summary of how Shinobi plays and why Shinobi is cool, which in fairness it is, but we're still away from meaningful Sega coverage in the press, even their own press. Next time on Sega Aiden, the Master System, it's Shanghai.